It is OEM Live, and we are so excited to have you back as we talk about FCA, Chrysler, uh, Fiat, Mopar, all Jeep. the Jeep, all the Ram. <laughs> I can't keep track of all the things that they got, all the great things that are um, going to happen. Plymouth? Plymouth? What happened to Plymouth, by the way? Plymouth went away. Went away. Oh, <laughs> no. Those were the good My days. first call. <laughs> um, we've got a lot to cover today. We want to get in it. But I'm so excited. We teased you last month that we might have Doug on set, and it did work out. He did get to join us for this. Um, Doug, thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's kind of a blast. Yeah, I was telling somebody the other day, I was <clears throat> thinking back to the first time that I'd met you and interviewed you when you were still at Chrysler at the time. Yeah. And uh, so long ago, in fact. Back at SEMA. No. Well, there was a SEMA interview, was... but then remember when I came up to Wixom? Okay. And we met at Fuser. Got it. And did a quick little interview yeah, yeah. about the announcement of Panel Bond now being a requirement across, mm -hmm. well, Bond, across the whole thing. Um, and it was so awesome because most always didn't want to talk to press at the time and you drove right over and so now full circle um I, everybody we're actually showing them a little clip of that interview and i remember that to get in the camera with you i had to stand on phone books do you remember that <laughs> i do because <laughs> <laughs> you were so tall was, so, that was so i was funny. standing on like four phone books so yeah. um, what is she doing <laughs> she's getting taller yeah i had to get in the shot so i didn't do the interview like this the whole time so that was awesome but now you're back and full circle you're back because you're with fuser yeah that worked out really well. Everything is cool. Everything is cool. And luckily today I get to talk about like a little bit about my past history, so to speak. We'll, we'll bring yeah. it up why we did some stuff that we did back then. Yeah, and the role that Fuser gets to play in that. Well, guys, y'all are just fun. back to be back. We're back. We've spent the last like what? Five days together? Week or so Six together. together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Multi city tour. Denver to Montana <laughs> to back again <laughs> to snow in one and yep. a heat wave in the other. It's been, a, it's been an amazing. Where'd you guys go? Uh, miss an email. <laughs> uh, so we went to Denver for CSE. And then we went to but Billings. Remember, for you're the not allowed. Montana Car <laughs> Repair Association. Okay. And then we all left Denver together and went to uh, Billings, Montana, and the Montana Collision Repair Association had a trade show. Which was awesome. Yeah, it was really awesome. I guess my invite must have got lost by the sleigh husky that came to drop it off. Well, you got to watch them dogs, man. <laughs> <laughs> Your two dogs probably scared them away. Oh, right, yeah. Ah. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's get into this. First of all, Doug, we've thrown up as we opened the show with the ad that you guys started running. Was it about fourth quarter of last year that I saw this ad for the first time? Yeah, the end of last year. And like I was saying earlier, this was a little bit of a joke when it came up just between us. And it made sense. When somebody put it on paper, it was like, this is a great way just to lead forward. Kind of a nice campaign that says what the industry really needs to do. Um, yeah. And that's follow William guidelines. Yeah, it is amazing. We've actually referenced it a couple of times already on the show this yep. year about, oh, that Fuser ad, follow the OEM, yep. follow the OEM, and then refer to rules one and two, follow the OEM. Um, but let's get started for what everybody's actually wanting to watch us talk about today, not yep. just us talk to each other. Um, finding collision repair information for FCA. Um, so like I tell everybody, I start every day on the ICAR portal. Um, you can go to rts.icar.com. Um, or what you're seeing here is you can actually just go to icar.com and then just yep. hit that technical knowledge. And you're right in the same spot. Uh, button. And Mark, what do they got? What are all my options under that technical knowledge button? Well, well, first of all, the reason why you'd want to go here is to get a global idea of what you got to do on the car you're going to repair. So obviously OEM information, you got links there. We got uh, calibration requirements, restraint system replacement search, glass replacement, uh, collision repair information news, partial replacement like sectioning hybrid vehicle information, uniform procedures for collision repair. And if all of that fails, you could always then click into and ask iCar. So a yeah. lot of options there to know what's going on with the cars yeah, you're working on. a lot of them there. And so if I just, we'll just start with OEM calibration requirements, I can go in there. Yep. Um, I can enter a, a make and model yep. of a it's car. Make model specific, and then you just look at what options you have, and then there's information about it. And this is not gonna tell you necessarily how to fix it. It's going to tell you what's going to be there and some different things, whether it's going to throw a code on the dash, whether it's not, and just information, because you know, how often is it where people, they'll start writing an estimate and they'll say, well, there's no light on the dash or everything's good. Wait, 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 I have a question. Yeah. So, I mean, I know as us, as like the lay people of the industry, we've been saying that not all codes do a dash light. Correct. But we do have an engineer. Oh, yeah. So, do all problems give a dash light? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, see, It'd be so like a Christmas tree if they all did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole dashboard would be lit up like you One know Manhattan, up. like yep. Broadway, with all the lights on. If you had a, a diagnostic trouble code set off, some sort of 
illuminated light on the dashboard, it would just be ridiculous for the redundancy that would happen, especially just the security system alone. You'd have the light come on and off all the time because of the changing uh, uh, algorithms for security systems. Yeah, in fact, we had a little demo from yeah. GM the other day that kind of made me and Mark go, we need to go get a hot dog stand. Yeah, it's called. we're going to talk to you about later. <laughs> it was uh, it was the breakout box, and uh, I got on Amazon and ordered one right from the pr presentation. It was awesome. Yeah, when mine comes in, we're going to do a little video. It's going to yeah. be awesome. So, um, so we got calibration requirements there, but we also now have the OEM partial replacement search, and I yep. love this as an estimator because if I'm not using an estimating system that may have repair procedures or hints or something built in, before I might go pay or go spend the time researching what may be available to me on an OE website. This kind of lets me know up front whether something exists in that part that I'm looking for. Kind of your cheat sheet. Well, I was going to say that that was not a cheat sheet, but more of my organizational extraordinary skills. Oh, got it. She's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> She's cheating. It's, you know. I'm, I'm well, no, this, you know, this right here, it's just uh, the RTS website gives you a lot of information to know what really to look for. This will make you a much better estimator in finding all the damage on the car and what you need to do. Right, exactly. It also makes me point to total loss a little Absolutely. earlier sometimes when I'm when I'm working on a car. Yep. Um, so within the repairability technical support portal, obviously you have that screen that comes up that shows you all the logos and, and grill icons for every manufacturer. Yep. Um, if we choose Chrysler and come in here, um, we've got a couple of options. Obviously, I do like the, the news and information. I like to see what mm -hmm. bulletins or some things that ICAR have written that help me as an estimator um, a lot. Um, we see the partial replacement, hot links, et cetera. But I've got two options here with mm -hmm. our folks from uh, FCA. I've got a pay site and I've got a free site. Yep. So, Larry, is there a difference between the two? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a big difference on it. The, the free site will, one, doesn't have any hyperlinks to anything that's highlighted. It's just usually PDF copies, so you're not going to get a hyperlink to disconnect the battery or follow this procedure or how to remove this. Um, it's also generally not updated as much. No, well, it's not generally. It's, 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 just, not, it's not updated as much <laughs> as the, the repair information that's on the website, uh, the pay site. So the pay site's always the best place to go. For quick in and out stuff, estimated, something like that, you want to figure out something real quick, yeah, you could probably use the free site. Technicians should always use the pay site, plain and simple. Um, I don't like third-party vendors in, in many cases because they're like, well, it's like a free site. The problem is, is they get permission from the OEMs to copy their information and put it in, but that might come in once every five weeks, once a quarter. Um, once a year. Uh, uh, once a year. I mean, I've told this story before. I, I was at Mercedes-Benz. On a Monday, we were in class. We were sectioning the unit side on a, uh, on a uh, ML, and we came in the next day, and you know, a couple of guys had to print out the information that we looked up the day before, and we printed it out, and all the taped off lines where we were going to make cuts were completely wrong. They changed it overnight, which was a really good lesson for us to realize you have to go back in there all the time. You don't know when it's going to change or when it's going to get updated. And we found this with the Chevy Cruze, that the information on the pay site and the free, excuse me, on the free site and on the third party vendor site was different than when we had, when we went on to the pay site, which uh, Jason and I figured out when we were going through all the information to see what could and could not be there. So don't be cheap. Yeah, it, exactly. Just pay for yeah. this, and it's, it, once again, it's still dirt cheap. What is this, $4.60, I think, per day, it, it, you know, if you average it out across the year? Yeah, that, which we decided was a cup of coffee. Yeah. For, for, but now, a lot of people like to go, so we've thrown this in this time, OEM One Stop. If you're not on the iCar website and you're on the OEM One Stop and you hit that, they have a different look. Doug, what's going on with that to theirs? So they're, they're, they're breaking it out, trying to get you attracted to the collision. Um, because that was the newest thing shortly after OEM One Stop launched. And, and it, the idea behind the collision tab was to give as much free info as could be given. Okay. Again, it's like Larry said, it's for estimating. It's for that groundwork mm -hmm. to, get you, to get you moving. Uh, the flip to that is the mechanical site, which is the outside version of the dealer site. So you're truly getting the dealer data. You know, when you call the dealer and you ask for something uh, and you get it or maybe you don't get it, you can go in here and get the exact same information, less certain uh, security things, key codes and such as that, that's real blocked. But so if I hit collision, uh, if I'm on OEM one stop, if I hit the collision button, I'm going to the free site. If I hit the mechanical button, I'm going to the pay site. It'll, yeah, at that point it takes you into tech authority and sets you up for the payment. Oh, that's awesome. But one thing you gotta keep in mind is that as an estimator, most of your stuff for the added stuff is going to be a mechanical not in collision. Yep. So under bumper you know, removal and replacement, it might even give you a pattern 
I'm not saying this definitely for Christ, but it might give you a pattern on how to drill out the holes or light up the holes to make the holes in the bumper cover to put the sensors in there. They're not going to tell you how to aim the sensors and do anything. That's in the mechanical that's section. Mechanical side, yeah. And that's where the collision guys get lost on that. They don't know where that is. And I think eventually, in probably three, four years, the pay sites will have hyperlinks <coughs> to procedures that would be required. So you remove the bumper, procedures for this, and it takes you to the hyperlink in the pay site, maybe to the mechanical side. But, you know, like Doug said, you got to go to the mechanical side for a lot of this information on these. It's a rolling yeah. computer. That's really what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, when you're, and when you're looking at it, you know, the, the, the free site, really a good site for writing an estimate. Yeah, that's kind of a good idea. place to start. It's the that. starting point. You want to fix the car? The pay site. Yeah, you really should be in right. that. Well, let's go to where we always like to go because we tell everybody you got to go to the OEM, you got to go to the pay site, you got to get access on yep. every car each and every time before you touch the car. Um, so here we're going to hit to the website and it's going to ask me for my account. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to hit my account. If I have one, I'll log in. If I don't have one, I'll. Um, I can sign up and pay. You correct. Can buy one. Yeah. Okay. And it's free well, at this well, point. Well, and the, right? the login is yeah. the same whether you're paying for it or you're not. Yeah. It's right. just what side you want to go to. So you create an account, and if you're going to log in and pay, then you just, that's where you go. Keep going. So password. I've got my account here. Um, I'm going to log in and create that. Um, and then right now we're at the, still at the free level, right? Yep. Absolutely. Okay. What do I get on the free level? So you get the position statements, everything that's been published that's still in existence. And I say that because position statements can come and go. Mm -hmm. They can change or be backed away from. Uh, in this case, there's a structural repair parts usage statement that I really don't think people have ever read. Um, that clearly, right in the middle, we'll go to the next, gives the bottom line statement of FCA, and that is you can't do anything unless they tell you you can. So you can't be cutting and slicing parts unless there's a procedure for that. And then second to that is when you get into uh, salvage structural parts, they're just not condoned, I'll use that word. Mm -hmm. They don't accept that because there's too many unknowns. Just too many. Yeah. I, I want to kind of go back and make that clear. So if the OE says, I can't, I can't. Right. So the absence of statement doesn't mean I'm free to create my own we're, we're talking a legal aspect. Correct. You can do whatever you want in life, but um, legally you'll be held more liable if you don't follow what the OEM tells you to do with their particular car uh, or their particular procedure on their vehicle. And if you don't do it with, with the way they want you to, and something happens, then you could be in big trouble. You're we learned that last year. Yep. I've been saying it for the last 15 years, but we learned it last year in a court case that made a big sound for everybody that they realized, oh, wait a second. Well, we can't do what we want. <laughs> right. You know, so the, I think the good part here is that, I mean, obviously, to take ICAR somewhat off the hook, ICAR specifically says follow the OE, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So here this, the OE specifically tells us, if I don't have a procedure, don't do it. So for those out there that have the misnomer that believe if there is not a particular repair procedure from the OE, you can fall back on the uniform procedures and codes from ICAR. And that's no. not true. Right. No. ICAR so. even has two articles. They actually updated one of them. Uh, I think it was 2007. And I think in 2013, they updated the 2007 article that UPCRs may not be applicable to newer vehicles anymore. Right. And the real thing you have to realize is, is that uh, the argument of real body man versus parts changer. It takes a lot more skill to change some of these parts nowadays than to actually try and figure out how to fix them. And the, the big issue that comes in nowadays is, oh, well, I've been doing it for 30 years. I'll figure out how to do it. Yeah, that's all well and good if you want to make a project car that you're just going to show at a show and you're not going to drive or you're going to be the only one driving it. You can't go ahead and change the aspect of how these crash parameters are made because you got to remember the collision pulse uh, on a vehicle is designed into the vehicle structure along with the electronics and the plastics and the steels and, and this crash testing gets done predicts this and their crash testing and the repairability gets, uh, the repair procedures get figured out into that also. You can alter a lot of different things, not just the other electronics, airbag timing. You can, you can really change that around and you can change the way the car crushes right. and, and wind up trapping people in a car and the car can become on fire and people can get uh, you know badly injured right. you'd be held liable right. for so it. If you're ever working with uh, an insurance adjuster or a, an IA or whatever and they try to kind of push that uh, general sectioning guidelines from ICAR across the table at you, well right here is where you can kind of get to push back and mm -hmm. go, nope, can't do it, whole part has to go in because Chrysler says no, they said FCA it. says no, and ICAR says always follow the OE, discussion is over. Yep. Awesome. Um, and then publications are in there as well. It's all kinds of publications. 
Um, next screen. There's the uh, the old paint decks. Passive. I loved those, by the way, with the, the little, little three ring. ring vinyl. I, yeah, I heard yeah. you say uh, that earlier yeah. today. Seam sealer deck too. I used, I used to, to give those so cool. out in the iCar uh, uh, Chrysler yeah. class. Mm -hmm. yes. We used to give out all the decks. The actually had them must have been ridiculous to print all those out. They were in color, they were nice, but they showed you a whole bunch of different things on there. And it was really cool because it showed you all the paint imperfections and how to take care of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, even warranty type work and stuff yeah. like that. Yep. I always felt so cool and important when I had them. Just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> then probably one of the, the best that's out there is the, uh, the passive restraints replacement matrix. And when this was created, the idea was to take the guidelines in service publication, condense it off into a simple PDF that could be then just given away gratis. Because we knew back then that if you replaced the driver's airbag because it was deployed, let's, let's pick that one. There were many other things that you actually had to do, and then there were other things that you might need to do. Yet, no one was doing it. Uh, I, I would venture to say, Doug, no one's still doing that. So. Last time I talked to someone in the parts industry, uh, the count of driver airbag to steering column was probably an order of 250 to one. So if you've got a driver's bag deployed with FCA, with most vehicles, definitely most ladder vehicles, they need a steering column and a whole bunch of other stuff. Yet the sales indicate that's not going on. So either it's not happening or we're putting some kind of other steering column in and where that came from, I don't know. Has it been in an accident? Maybe it's already done it, it's stroked or it's partially stroked. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, it's great. The whole reason the car's probably been in the salvage yard at all was because it was in an accident. Yeah. So then that's going to rule that steering column. I, out as well. I would lean on the yeah. side of it's just not getting done. It's just not And it done. says, it's, I mean, I've read it in all data, I've read it in other, you know, <clears throat> third party uh, uh, publications, but also on the Chrysler site. If the vehicle, it specifically says, if the vehicle is involved in a frontal collision or an airbag deployment has occurred, the steering column must be changed. Mm -hmm. So frontal collision, <coughs> now once again, you know, unfortunately they don't clarify, you know, a light bumper hit or a massive, you know, type of collision. Yeah. Uh, but they do make an indication that if the airbag does go off, yep. you have to change the column. And I've seen plenty of airbags and I've you know, done on the engineering side, I've done investigations and stuff like that, and sure enough, you'll see the airbag was changed and there's no listing on the estimate at all for a column. So it's not like right. they're buying used ones, they're just not, they're just yeah. not doing it. And if you look in the matrix in a lot of the uh, um, estimate database systems, it tells you that, you know, when you read the, the big listing and stuff, yeah. it tells you what you, gotta, what you gotta do with the car. Well, here's the problem, and we talk about this in the, in the estimating systems a lot. If you look at this matrix and how intense it is right here, um, most of your, your estimating systems don't put it all in here. Right. So when you go to the, to the, if you're just relying on the estimating database to hit the head notes for what is required if you're going to do this, you're missing a lot. I mm -hmm. mean, when we went back, what was it, five or six years ago when yep. Doug Gann was doing his airbag solutions thing on yep. everything that was missing out of the estimating systems. But I mean, you just look here, um, and, and so I think we're missing steering columns a lot, but I mean, let's just be real, Doug. We're me back here it says, I need to replace the seat backs and the seat back frames and the seat foam. Yeah, I guarantee you that's not getting done. No. No, no. they got the magic thread at the, at well. the uh, uh, upholstery guy that restitches it for you. I've seen that done. <laughs> I've seen it written on an estimate. Well, and the front, front seat belt anchor tensioners, how often yeah. is that getting done? Yeah. Let alone the columns and all that. And then and if you look at that publication, first a couple things about it. Number one, it's 38 pages. Nice little thing to just print off and have, right, as a reference right there. But it's only till 2013. So this is on the free right. side. Right. So this, you get free up to 2013, then if you want to go to 2017, just because it's not here doesn't mean it's not in the, on the pay side. Correct, so you're gonna have to go into Tech Authority to get the newer stuff. Yeah, I would say anything, probably most cars 2013 under hitting the shop are really close to that total loss yep. mark. So well, I, well, I can tell you, you know, if you replace an airbag and the steering column and the seat belt buckles and back seats and all, I mean, you're talking unless about- you, you, Unless you're you have like some sort of just tire failure with a pothole that caused the airbag to deploy, you're probably looking at, you know, a good extensive amount of damage to the front, and then you look into all those components on the inside, you're probably going to go over the top probably of limits with the $300 electronics. bumper cover and $9,000 worth of airbags. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then the, the <laughs> other thing is, what, so what, in the inspection side, that, that, that uh, chart also has in non-deployment. So if we've got a, a 
collision that didn't deploy the airbags at all, right. we still have to look at the anchors and do some investigation on all the interior trim panels and all those different things. So that's that's time, you know, and how often is that probably getting missed too? Uh, I'd say a lot, you know, and that's partly something we covered in last week's show yep. for blueprinting was checking seat yep. belts and all that. So I think a, motors, lot, yeah. a lot of people are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then the, I think the last little inquiry has quick links and that's going to take me to pay. This is the place <laughs> where you go and spend the money. Uh, and it, as an example today, there was a three for one deal. So if you yep. bought a day's worth of use, you got three days, which was really cool, especially if you're trying to educate a shop and everybody wants to have a little bit of extra time. Yeah. But yeah, from here, it pulls you into Tech Authority again. You do your login like we went through a minute ago, and then you pay the money. Yeah, and money well spent. If you average all that out across a year, it's, it's really like Larry said, it's not that much. And if you're a generalized shop and you're fixing maybe more than one FCA vehicle a month, well, then it definitely ends up being something you think that you want to have a year's worth of access to. Um, so pretty cheap insurance. And then, you know, let me ask you a question. It's great that you're on the show and you're not here with all the ones that we do. So let me just ask you. So if I was going to jump into these sites and I've never been there before, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. I know right? exactly <laughs> where you're going. How much, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, you got to figure out what this button does and that. I mean, to figure out what all the information is. How much time would I have to spend to jump through this site to understand it from just the average person, do you think? To, to write like an estimate, a good solid estimate that you've delved into it a little bit, I'm yeah. going to say two hours. Okay. You're going to do that. And then as an example. What about example, to just learn it? Like learn the site without a car? Just uh, like I got to see what's in there. You're, I would give you four hours just to go play inside uh, to taste it. Right? You're not, you're not really eating anything here. We're just getting a taste of it. There's so much information there and you can start to go down rabbit holes and it's, it's amazing what you'll learn. <laughs> and it's all with the BMW. Right yeah, I was just going to say, BMW with her was crazy. Whoa, look at that. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> Kristen, <laughs> stop. We have to do a show. I knew I know the BMW really well, and I gave her just, I just try to te do like when I consult for people. I try and show her where to go. Now yeah. figure it out. Where to, you're not going to hurt anything. Just go and figure this out and try and get your mind to think that pa you know, that, that portion, that way they want you to think. I started saying <laughs> Actoon. <laughs> all kinds Actoon. of things all day. I mean, I, I think <laughs> I got Didn't my stop. mind right. Chrysler, uh, Chrysler, <laughs> Chrysler does make it a little bit easier, like the GM yep. sites, a little bit more friendlier than yeah. some of the German sites, I'll be honest with you. But like Doug said, you can spend a lot of time learning uh, just how the site works, just on learning the site. Then each car, depending on what you're fixing on, you could spend a couple of hours it's almost a half a day looking up information depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah, you never you know? want your first time on an OE site to be because there's a car in your shop needing your attention at that moment. You definitely want to make sure you have some time to learn it, which goes back to what we've been talking about kind of over the last year and a half is that body shops are eventually going to need to identify one person within the shop mm -hmm. that is the research and OE technician that that's their full time job is finding that data. Yep. Um, and then that's going to force a lot of shops to have to relook at pay and classifications and flat rate versus salary because finding the money and the time to pay that person is going to be kind of a shop responsibility yeah. as well. And I can hear the painters already going, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now that we've gotten into Tech Authority, we have paid our money and we are in. Um, You've what landed. Do do? You're we've at, landed. You're at the home page. So it's a real quick orientation across the top. Uh, you've got a search function. You've got search, uh, service bulletins and slash recalls. So that's a whole nother bit to what we're talking about. Service info is what we call the service manual. That's where all of the meat of this is at. Then there's wiring diagrams. Owner's manuals are in here. You have access to the Mopar parts database if you want to go looking there. Um, the key tab for the collision industry at this level, so we're, we're going to call this a stepping in level. The estimating slash blueprinting level is the collision info tab. And what it does is it extracts from uh, the service information and actually adds to that uh, some other outside information, maybe the uh, standardized procedures. So there's a lot of things that FCA has att attempted to like standardize across all vehicles. Yeah, what I like about this, so I obviously I, I select my VIN <coughs> at the top and I can, I can filter all this by VIN or I can just do body and engine, right, and get there. I love the standard procedures. So what's really interesting is I hear over and over and over because I travel the country, the OEs need to do a better job of training this. And so far, every yeah. OE that we've looked at has, has had this has training. amazing training, There's training that's right been there. hidden in this guide the yeah, whole entire time. You know time. what the problem is? Nobody goes on the pay site and nobody wants to do that thing we learned back in school. Read. Read. 
They Wait. don't want to read. It's more. We it's more. You were spoon fed. <laughs> the spoon yeah. disappeared. Now it's time for you to grab your fork and have dinner. Yeah. And it's out there. Yeah. So if we look here, everything, and if we look at standard procedures, which is training, uh, we've got service after supplement restraint. We've got base coat, clear coat finish, finesse and buffing and polishing, uh, laser braze roof replacement, welding and weld bonding, corrosion protection, sectioning. I mean, you guys have some fantastic. I want to see you guys. But there's they some do. fantastic they do. They do. Um, they do. training up there. So. You know, it's funny. You know, I was looking on one of the, I don't know, the, the uh, Facebook sites, and there was somebody that said, does anybody out there have a grid of all the different metals and corrosion protection for all the vehicle manufacturers you can forward to me? Doesn't exist. That does not exist. And, and, but again, back to people want to be spoon-fed. They want to just have it easy on a chart, and that's not possible. Then the problem yeah. is with, with those charts, the charts wind up on a, on top of the desk yep. or on a bookshelf yep. in a binder, and they never, they never go back to it. They don't use it. That's the problem with a lot of these handouts and stuff like that. Unless you're really in tune with researching information and categorizing it the right way, most of these guys will get their nice little you know, laminated thing. They'll go, wow, this is great. And they'll put it over here, and never I'll, go, I'll go in there. I know I've given out laminates to people. I'll go into the shop, and I'll go, yeah, give me the laminate for this. And I know it by heart, because I wrote this stupid thing. But I'll go in there to ask them for it, and you know what it takes them? 20 minutes to a half hour to find, finally come back and go, ah, I'm really not sure where it is. But you told me you've been doing what I taught you, and <laughs> what I showed you to do, but you're not doing it, and that's why you have this problem. Yeah. So I gotta take you back to, like you said, I gotta go back to showing you how to, you know, showing you how to eat with a spoon to get to the knife and fork portion of it because you're not following what I told you to do. And that's the problem with it. You just gotta go and you gotta spend a little bit of time. It, it's funny, like he's talking about Facebook. How many people you know will go back home, body shop personnel, let's say, will go back home, something new comes out on Facebook, and what do they do? They figure out how to use it. Mm -hmm. They go on YouTube, they watch a video, yep. they do this. Oh, Instagram came out. Oh, I wanna get an Instagram account. Let me see how I do this. They go, they Google, they research it. Just to put up stupid personal pictures. But for their own job, People's lives depend on it. Oh, I don't want to read anything. I just want to let you know I'm so glad that you have an Instagram account. I do enjoy pictures of the dogs. So I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that was done. So I'm on fun. I'm unfriending you. <laughs> and, those, and, those, and those charts that, 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 that companies hand out or that people even make themselves, they're dangerous. Because if you put it up on the wall and something changes, you're, you're trying the, the to, chart doesn't change. You're oversimplifying what is actually a very complicated. Yeah process. That's why it's every car every time. Every OEM car and every yep. OEM has a different guideline on how to deal with common steels, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Some say X amount of heat <coughs> for X amount of time, the other says Y and Y. FCA says zero heat for zero time. Yep. There you go. That's simple, simple, right? That one always works. If we go in here, right, we chose under standard procedures, we just chose service after supplemental restraint system deployment. And I got a long list of information of stuff I got to do over there. You do. But when you look at it, if you look at the driver airbag portion, and then you think back to that, that PDF matrix we just showed a minute ago, it's got the exact same information. That, that document was created from this service information. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't just in a coffee discussion. It was drawn right out of here just to simplify. So now you're into what we'll call the general mechanic who's doing warranty work on your car is going to be looking at the exact same stuff. When you go to, well, we've just flipped over to the service tab, so this is the actual service manual. It's the exact same information. Again, like I say, it's all linked together. Right. So you're getting first kind of a filtered version in the collision tab, and now that you're on, this, on the uh, service information, it's all there. <coughs> Every bit of it's there. But we want to also be clear that the pay site has more than the free site. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. massively more. Yeah, so you, uh, because the free the, site gives you this, and then it's <coughs> the collision. The, the collision info <coughs> tab alone probably has a thousand percent more. Right. Flop the other way, and you've got years of reading. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. And then still sticking under this, or still sticking with the standard procedures, obviously, also, we're back under collision info. Yeah. Um, but now it's showing me my sectioning locations and procedures for that. Everyone always wants to know what's the easiest way to do something, right? Can I section it? And if so, where? And in here, they will tell you exactly where. Um, and the locations were defined. They weren't random guesses. Um, but in the same document, it also tells you where you cannot do things. So if right. You can't touch these parts. If you do cut them and weld them, you have so radically changed the vehicle, it is truly gone. It's a total. Uh, and you can't back up. 
So if you're also thinking about putting in a, some kind of a unicide assembly that you got somewhere, you might want to be well, looking at I all this stuff. Seen, I mean, it just, I've walked through shops numerous occasions. We've seen it come up online where the shop actually does, they order a complete new B pillar yep. and then section it in. Yep. Just It was why? faster. The, it was easier. I've been doing this for 40 years and I've had a problem. No, because so, you know, some of them actually have it where they cut the roof out and then you actually you know, pull part of the roof out and then you put the panel in. Right. Then you weld the roof back up and they don't, they, they think that's the wrong way to fix it. So they just kind of make it up. It's, Mark, it's <coughs> unreasonable that I have to take all this car apart and, and uh, what is it, disturb factory seams to factory make that welds. repair. And factory corrosion factory welds, They yeah. come up with that, that, that I-car statement that meant something back in the 80s. And now they, they, they use it like it's a, a, um, a Superman cape or a, a Captain America shield. It's like, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm, you know, I'm going to weld 9,000 pins in the side of this car and pull. Yeah, but what about the B-pillar reinforcement right behind that B-pillar yep. that was pushed in? Oh, no, that's okay. How is that okay? They're sandwiched up against each other. you'll never see it. You'll never, you'll see, never it. see it. That's but the, the outside looks that's great. Cool. Yeah. So let's go into welding and some weld bond requirements because Chrysler was really the first OE that kind of came out and said, hey, you're going to put our panels back differently than we make them at the factory. And when you do replace them, you are going to do a weld bond procedure. Right. Um, and that was during your time, wasn't it, Doug? It was. Um, the idea there, how can we best put the car back together? And when I say that, corrosion protection is always a concern. Being in the rust belt, you know, I'm used to seeing cars that had a quarter panel put on three years later it's rotted out. So if you want to eliminate that, um, while cavity wax is awesome, the best way to do it is to do a weld bond. So you put the adhesive in, that's your corrosion protectant, it's the sealant, weld through it. If by chance some of those welds may, not, may have been inferior, now we've got this little extra layer of adhesive that's gonna be uh, holding the whole thing together. And there was, there was some pushback, from actually outsiders, who said, aren't you changing your cars? Well. We went to the engineering world and we asked the question, can we do this? This wasn't a personal decision. They contemplated and they said, you know what? You're good. It's perfect. You may be making the car a little better and that's fine. You're not going to change any of the car's capabilities other than you're going to make sure it's got corrosion protected. Right, so, we're not putting any airbag deployment or any timing no, issues or anything else no. in, in danger with that. Well, no, no matter how well you weld it to begin with, if it rusts out, it doesn't matter. It's weak. Right. It's weak. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, we talk about it a little bit here, but there's also Chrysler, FCA has a position on weld through primer. Yeah. That's, that's, but that's like, what was that, 2002? 2002. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's only new. 15 years it, ago. It's 15 <laughs> years ago. The big thing that I see with a lot of these guys with the weld bonding is, and, and because Doug is here, and I've said it numerous times because Doug and I have talked, we were on an SAE board together and we've talked about this, but it's easier to hear it out of the, the, you know, the horse's mouth itself, uh, so to speak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you have the... That the, just the, made not watching the show outer, alone <laughs> worth it. I'm just saying. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you work on the outer panel non-structural non components and you're doing the well bonding procedure, in the sectioning joints, let's say up in the sail panel and the vertical cut in the rocker panel, it's supposed to be a butt joint with backing all glued in. Mm -hmm. Now, we get on Facebook, we see all the time, oh, I get ghost lines. And I try to explain to everybody, you're doing it the wrong way, and that's why you're getting the ghost line. You're not V-grooving the edges down a little bit. You're not making sure that the bond is, you know, uh, uh, sealing properly, and you're not using the, uh, a good quality fiber reinforced body filler in the manner in which you, which you guys required it. Now, I've had shops that I've worked for, I used to do it, never had a problem with it. Then I have the BMW guys come in and say, well, we use the BMW glue, and we use the BMW uh, um, you know, uh, C, you know, uh, body filler, and we gotta put the blankets over it, or we gotta put the lamp on it, and we never have a problem with that. Uh, okay, that's a different material. But with the fuses stuff, that's what was originally in the, in the product there, um, when, when you were with, with Chrysler, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the sectioning procedure and how not to get a ghost line that these guys are all crying about it online? So first thing, you, I'm gonna go right back to the BMW process and they followed the process, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They did it. And then they go to a regular, what I'll call just a regular butt joint and what do they do? They hurry, they rush, they cheat. Yep. That's where it's at. Uh, a big sail panel, truly it is a tough joint to pull off. A rocker, a small section, piece of cake. 
shops that are in, again, we go back to the Rust Belt. They love to do an adhesive only rocker because it's not going to rust ever. Uh, you weld down there, it's going to come back and haunt you. You get up into the sail panel, now we need to spend some time making those panel, that one panel edge, really tight. You've got to pull the whole thing together. So if your panel's ground right, you've got it bonded right, you're locked down, follow the guidelines and the procedures, and then use the fiber reinforced filler. That's another area, cheat. Oh, I just use filler. Right, right. Well, it's not all the same. Mm -hmm. So when you follow the process, it does work. And I've played with it in the shop just to prove it does, it doesn't, and how to create some of the, the, re the read through. Uh, and some, but it's like anything. Some guys and gals just can't do it. Wait, what? Some guys and gals just can't do it. You know what? Fine. If you just can't do it, don't do it. Then go back to a welded. Well, bar. you mean I have to actually let it cure for the amount of time under the right heating recommendations for the time you said? I got to kick that sucker to paint. <laughs> that's my point. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that's what happens. Yeah. That's it's the rush. It's yeah. Everything yep. has to be planned. So when you're putting any panel on, and we've got any kind of adhesive. It all needs to be laid out. Otherwise, you're never going to make the work time on the adhesive. Right. It's going to kick. Which goes back to what we've been talking about. You know, we talked about it at CIC. Um, there was a presentation from the like the education committee yep. where our current way of paying technicians leads to the hurry. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and we're going to have to just rethink the way we are. If I'm paying by the hour, then my you know, my you pay by incentive the hour. is to kick more hours through that. Yep. Yeah, well, if yeah. you pay flat rate, it's a quality issue. Yeah. If you pay, uh, you know, basically a salary or an hourly wage just up by the clock hour, then it's a uh, production issue. Yeah. And it's all about management. And it's it's yeah. about so management. And, yeah. you know, a lot of times what happens is, is a car lays around for, what, two weeks? Trying to get estimates and supplements done. Right. Because they got to wait for approval, they think. <clears throat> and then, as soon as they get enough money, they want to go into production, and now it's hurry up. And the second the car's painted, it's getting put back together, and we're buffing it right away. So, like, you know, from the time you actually start doing collision work to the time you actually try and deliver it, it's like a five-day time period, yet the car's been there for a month and a half, and it always comes back to bite them in the ass. Yeah. When, in essence, if you knew what you were doing, here, come down, write the car. I'm continuing on to repairs. Sorry. Yeah. Come down and catch it. <laughs> now, Chrysler does have, so it, for weld bonding and adhesives, <coughs> um, they have a couple of approved products. Um, we have Fuser 112B, um, and then we have the, what is it, 8816? 8816. 8116. 8116. Yep. For 3M. Uh, from 3M. Right. That is available there. Yep. So um, can, I, can I go grab, like, another brand of one of those two or from those two just something that maybe another salesman came through and fixed car with you know you decide who you want to go with you can either call the jobber or you can read the <laughs> OE information your choice they've been tested yep all right the manufacturer tested these two adhesive products along with probably some others these are the ones they liked uh, and that's not the service <coughs> side of the world that tests them by the way that's the materials engineering guys so that's the team that's building the car Right. They picked it for a reason. Well, right. and, the, and the other part of that is that, you know, it's really by the part number. Because just because it says, it says Fuser there, <coughs> there's a part number. Right. Just because it says 3M, there's a part number. It's not so Fuser you, so 108B, on it's 112B. Yeah. Right. There's a difference. Yep. So just make sure you've got the right one for the right car. That may mean that I have to have a couple of different products in my shop if I'm fixing but a couple of different models. But I can't like crazy glue and do it? No. Gorilla, or gorilla, gorilla the glue. The with the helmet gorilla on glue. The, 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 you know, the, the, the eye beam that time. Can we try to glue you to the eye beam later? <laughs> <laughs> totally in for that. That sounds like fun, Doug. <laughs> Doug, welcome to Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> he's, just, me. he's just wondering when the show's over. And very, oh, and, and, and very important, this car we're going to talk about now was not done in Arkansas. <sighs> just telling you. Yeah. And the guy says, I'm a real body man. I know uh, what I'm doing. Yep. I'm doing a good job. So, so this one's a fresh, freshy, right? This is, so like, some, this like is new week, news. Two weeks ago, right? Yeah. Um, so here's the thing that a reason I wanted to talk about it and I'm so glad that it popped up when we had Doug here and I actually even posted on this post said tune into this show and we'll make you famous. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I feel like what was that movie was it Tombstone I'll make you famous or, or you know whatever I'll be your huckleberry mm -hmm. one of those two lines or whatever but the reason that I wanted to talk about this was I wanted to not only talk about what's wrong how it doesn't follow um, the Chrysler or Jeep procedures for this vehicle but because we have Mr. Engineer with us. That's your new official title. Mr. Um, Engineer, I like that. <laughs> why, why this is wrong? So... You show this isn't from 1970? No. This That's what is, it looks like. 
It's 81. Um, this is 81. The bench. 1981 wants their repair procedure The bench back. was around in 81. It was. Um, so that's sure. The all right, Doug, dumb. what all besides possible decapitation and immediate death is wrong <laughs> <laughs> with this repair? So to be fair, I've had three, four days to think about this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but has your thought changed in four days? <laughs> it got worse. No, it's gotten worse. Uh, first thing that everybody needs to understand is on a Jeep Wrangler, the vehicle's designed to have its doors off. The doors come off, so the, the vehicle needs to react in a collision safely. Right. Without the doors. <laughs> so in most cars, the doors are also one of the load paths. They take that, that energy from the front, shoot it up to the A pillars, through the doors, and to the rear. That's not here. So all you've got on a Jeep is that top tube and then the bottom rocker. What did they do here? Uh, they chopped into the car. There's got three cross members exposed on the floor. They put in a uh, factory silver painted side, so I know that's not a Mopar service part. Why, does it come in paint color? No, only black, oh. just like Henry Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got these three really clean weld joints, which tells me that they just saw us all straight through. They cut through. pretty straight, though. <laughs> Let's use the term clean. Rather loosely here. Well, from a little the look bit. Of that. Yeah, look at the yeah. interior. Uh, my question is: Is why does Chrysler sell new doors with the door trim panels on and yellow paint on the inside? Just wondering. I, you know, mispackaged. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, they ordered the wrong part. They I ordered know. the wrong part color. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but, but basically, what's going to happen now when that vehicle is hit? Doors on or doors off? If the car is hitting the side solidly, what I anticipate is two thirds of that B pillar is just going to flip in like a mouse trap. Yeah. Um, I watched a test be done many years ago on, on a product that was modified similar to this, um, and it was catastrophic. Right, this pillar's not the hot stamp boron, but it's a high metal strength. Uh, this is not good. It's not going, it's, it's going to, you've got a, a bend point just built right in. It's going to go there. It's he soft in the middle. windows like they used to back in the day to be able to weld the reinforcement. He welded just straight across. So whatever he caught, he caught when he welded, if you really think about it. Well, he didn't make a window to be able to get the inner structure piece. He got it know. in and got it out. Plus well, somebody he, goes through and blows a, blows a stoplight on that, it gets broadsided. Uh, sad. We've got, sad. We got fatalities. We got. Yeah, you know. there is a, and it is not on a Jeep product. But and this car's is, burning gas probably right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, I will say this: uh, there is a decapitation claim on the East Coast. It is not a Jeep vehicle, but yeah. it is from a B pillar passenger. Did the cave in like a mousetrap thing? Yeah. Killed the passenger in the car. Um, what is the typical age group of people that drive Jeep Wranglers? Um, I would Mid -30s. say a lot of teenagers. Yeah. Mid thirties on yeah. on the you purchase know. side. Yeah. They were hey. higher, but a little younger on the used side. Right. Yeah, I see, it, I see a, lot of, a lot of the young kids in college in, in my area in New York driving around in you know, a couple of year old ones and stuff like that. Unless they got some money, they got one of the brand new ones with all the big knobby tires and the big wheel wells and stuff. And then you have, I see other parts of uh, New York State where you have the mid 40s guy that likes to go on adventures on the weekend and stuff and yeah. he's got it all hooked up with the winch and everything like and that. And those guys typically put it on a trailer, trailer it to the mud, uh, RV, ATV park. We got a shop, one of our friends up here in Arkansas and he travels down to Hot Springs almost every weekend and his Jeep's trailer. But for the you most had part- one for a while. I had one, yeah, like, I, I took mine to the RV park, but I occasionally drove mine on the street back and forth. That was my midlife crisis Jeep. Soon to be followed by my midlife crisis Corvette. So that you I'm put three to, miles on. I'm working on another midlife crisis. Um, I'll let you know later. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, typically, we see a lot of kids, you know, in that that late 20s and under driving these, and those really aren't our best drivers. No. Um, so this is just catastrophic. Very popular in California right. and, and Florida and stuff because you got the either the soft top or the removable top. You got the doors that come off. It's you know it's great for you know, nice weather activities. Yeah, so the reason <coughs> I wanted us to address it was it has nothing to do with being anti-used parts or nope. whatever. This is just it's improper repair, and this is what happens when you try to outsmart the repair procedures or think that your skill set outsmarts repair procedures. <coughs> well, and when this, when this vehicle is completed and painted back uh, whatever, you know, maroon or whatever the color is, yeah. it probably looked okay. Yeah, a couple things here. Um, so there was some notes on this one when it hit social media. Apparently, um, it was totaled at the dealership, and then but the customer wanted to save it, and yep. so the shop elected to save it. 
Am I am I negated from liability, Larry? Because the no, customer asked Eric me to and I it. covered this at the Northeast Trade Show. Uh, we covered it on Friday night, and and you know we're gonna have another video with with Erica on this. And it's like, no, you you really you really kind of like you know gave the defense, uh, excuse me, the the plaintiff a, a lot of ammunition to go against you in case something does happen or something does go wrong with this car. And I love the fact that you got that hook at the front of the rock yeah, at the bottom that? at uh -huh. the beginning. It's not even tied down to the frame machine. The frame machine's basically being used, I think, as a work It's bench. a table. Yeah, it's well, a table. bending over is hard. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. it's being used as a work table. It's not tied down to the machine uh, at all or attached or affixed to the, to, to the apparatus. There is what looks like to me, I don't see any measuring unit underneath there. And so I'm assuming that we're gonna use the old tape measure and you know, we'll measure off the frame machine up to get our height measurements because you know, that, that always works out well. We've seen guys do that before, so. Larry, I don't have to measure. If I cut the part and it fits, then it means it's square. Right, yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's what the chain's for. <laughs> to make My the door's thick grape. I just give an umbrella with every car I repair. <laughs> that's basically what the guy's doing. Well, I think the, the shocker, the really the sad part for us is this was at a dealership. Yep. Um, so um, you would expect more. There's access to everything. It's built for If I went into the shop, I would recommend that the tech who did this job should be fired along with the manager. Yeah, exactly. They've got to go. Yeah. So structural repair parts usage, um, FCA's position statement on that. We covered a little bit earlier, basically. Yeah. I think it points out everything yeah. they did wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and that picture, I mean, we, we could go on and on. There's parts in the interior. It's on the rack. It's not chained down. It's, uh, oh, there's a lot of stuff. They, what do they do right? Not I'd love lot. to see if the guy even took any ICAR classes outside of the old 10 part. Yeah. Or the Back old collision the repair CRC 2000. Yep. You know, I, I want to see if he's taken anything since then, and, and I, I'm yeah. sure he hasn't. Um, but it's just a, it's a sad case. It's kind of mm -hmm. where we're at. Um, it's a good reminder for every shop owner out there that what I could do 15 years ago, and what I could do 10 years ago is now absolutely obsolete. Yep. So I love it when somebody tells me they've had 25, 30, 40 years experience. Well, all that's really worthless if it doesn't involve really the last. 24 hours, right? Because right. yeah. that's how frequently things Well, are if you want to use technology from 30 years ago, then fix 30-year-old cars. No. Show so, cars. Yeah. Just work on show cars. Oh, there's Trailer no money queens. in that, though. No. <laughs> Customers don't pay. No. You're constantly <laughs> chasing whatever. Um, so, Doug, talk to us a little bit about what's going on at Fuser. Um, things that we can expect coming from you guys, and not just with, with FCA, but what's coming out when working with some of the other OEs out there. So, there's always something new. That I can't tell you about. Thanks for right. coming. All right. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, okay, that's Doug's portion. We're done. If, if <laughs> I told it's you that I promised the cameras off, would you tell me? <laughs> Keep no. rolling. No. <laughs> it, so we're working with uh, a handful of manufacturers, um, getting deeper and deeper into their design world to try and. Uh, what I want to try and do is what I used to do. I want to be way up front, uh, planning for the repair, not at the end panicking and trying to get it put together because it, it becomes <coughs> a lot easier. Um, product wise, uh, we do have a couple in the pipeline uh, coming up with products that uh, kind of might be kind of a me too or, or just bringing better to the, uh, to the front. And it's interesting because a lot of the chemicals that are used, adhesives, not just all chemicals, in production, you know, we're already there. So now right. we're trying to tie it together out at the front. Um, and taking some of the other magic that we know about and maybe bringing it in saying, look, it's actually better than what you're using today. Now, since I really spoke to you last and we sat down, uh, Fuser became part of a bigger, larger family called RSG, yeah. the Refinish Solutions Group. Um, how has that <coughs> been for Fuser as a company and working within that greater uh, family of brands? It's probably been the best decision that was ever made. So it gave us an instant, uh, a larger foot to make a footprint. Um, we did lose some people in the changes that had to occur, but it's panned out really well because there's, there's more of a force on the street that we were able to hand train up front uh, and they've carried the, carried the mission. Um, heard what we had to say, they're changing shops one by one. Some of the stuff we just looked at and talked about, you know, I get pictures and, and such every day like that. It's like, no, they need to do this and this and this. So it's been really, really cool from, from my perspective to have the, uh, the abrasive side, the paints, paint gun side, uh, the tapes, you know, everything is suddenly at my fingertips uh, to 
what I call play a little more and come up with ideas. And then we're all working together and want to achieve kind of the same thing, improve the, the industry shop by shop. Right, and that works together for the favor of the shop because really now working with Fuser or working with the rest of RSG allows a, stop, a shop, kind of a one-stop shop, yeah. so to speak, to get what they need to repair the vehicle start to finish. Yeah, and you're always being sold when these folks come in your door, right? And we all just tense up. Um, all these folks in the field are legitimate. They've all got some hands-on training. They've got lots of experience. So when they come in, yeah, okay, it's a sales guy. You, you push them off a little bit, but they're working with the teams in the shops and improving them. And I think that's just critical for yeah. all of us. We're just trying to raise this level so that someday we don't see repairs like that Wrangler going on. Yeah, I think that's why the three of us get up every day still and, yep. and we get we get kind of berated and belittled and yelled at <laughs> online and I yeah. get told to go to the kitchen and make ice and yeah. a sandwich um, <laughs> and whatever. Uh, but at the end of the day, we get up and we come and do it again because there's still a customer that picked up that Jeep that's yep. probably going to put their kid in it that thinks their kid's safe tonight. And that is the atrocity. So if anybody knows where to find that Jeep, um, Mississippi is a short three, four hour drive for me. I yep. am happy to go look at that thing. That was Mississippi, right? Yeah, was that was Mississippi. Yeah. Yep. So I'm, I'm more than happy to get in a car and go down there. And, and, and nothing against Mississippi. That's going on in many shops around the country today. No, so. There's some great shop in Mississippi. Joel Absolutely. is there. He yeah. was on the SCRS board. Yep. So uh, Barnett's yep. Collision. Uh, yeah. Capital is down there. I mean, there's great shops in Mississippi. So we're not we're not thinking on Mississippi by any no. means. We're just that's just happened to be where. Now Arkansas, totally different story. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can tell those jokes because you live exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> um, and we'll we'll call the hogs after the yeah. after the show's over a little bit. So, Doug, thanks for coming. Thanks for sharing a little bit of that insight and knowledge that you have, um, and, and that background. I love it when people actually get to see the story of that things aren't made up. It's not mm -hmm. just a bunch of people sitting around having coffee going, let's say this to yeah. do to our cars. Um, that there are real reasons and lives are at stake. It's, yeah. it's, it's real. It's real information, how to put it back together the right way so that the next time around it will act the same and be as safe. Yeah, we just want, we want that customer to live. Yep. <coughs> so yeah. it's not about the car. So it's all about. I'll total them all day long um, if the customer lives. So that's fantastic. Well, be sure to go on to um, either the iCar site or go to OEM One Stop. Pop yourself over to the free site, look around, but then remember when it comes time for repair, you are always going to go back to the pay site. Um, that way you have mm -hmm. the most up-to-date and complete book of information um, that you need. Hopefully even just the little screen on supplemental restraints and what you have to do will mm -hmm. inspire you. Let's all be <coughs> honest, we've probably all fixed a Chrysler vehicle between Without the it. ages of 2008 and 2013 and haven't done steering columns and seat I frames and those things. Um, so there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to improve. I would love to be here next year and have someone from FCA tell me, oh man, we finally saw a spike. We the sold airbag 500 to... airbags and 500 steering columns. Yeah, Wouldn't that one, be great? one day we'll get there. Um, but next, uh, <coughs> next month, we're going to have another show for you coming to you um, um, on the uh, repairs. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also going to be diving into some other things on the Repair University, getting a little bit more technical into um, cooling systems. So we'll be going through radiators and condensers and evac and recharge and everything that's on the front end of the car. Um, so lots to do. We will see you next month on OE Live. Thank you.